I want to share with you parts of my childhood. When I grew up in the 70s in Austria, my father told my brother and I about the beauty of boxing, because boxing back the time in the 70s was one of the most popular sports ever. And the one man behind me, Muhammad Ali, reinvented boxing. Or as you would say today, he was a disruptor of boxing. He reinvented the way we thought boxing should be like. The Ali shuffle, the dancing, the circling around uh, the enemy in, right in the sports ring was unique. Back that time, there was the greatest boxer in between those two years, George Foreman, a huge, brutal boxer. And he came in as a favorite. Muhammad Ali, for the very first time, was not the favorite anymore. He was beaten. And in this boxing fight, there was a completely different Muhammad Ali. No boxing, no dancing, no shuffling, no circling around the enemy. Muhammad Ali stand there in this ring, in this corner, and got hit after hit after hit. He was punched by George Foreman harder and harder and harder. And he took every single fight, every single hit. But in round eight, the unbelievable happened. George Foreman, even tired from his own uh, punching, all of a sudden got a left and right and another left by Muhammad Ali. George Foreman went down and one of the biggest surprises of boxing sports history took part in Kinshasa that day. Later on, there was a press conference in Kinshasa and the journalists were asking, like, Muhammad Ali, what's going on with you? This was a different kind of Ali. This was not the dancing Ali. This was not the shuffling Ali. This was not the way you, we thought you will be boxing. And Muhammad Ali sat back and said to the journalists, defeat doesn't make you stronger, but it forces you to change. You have to change your pattern. You have to change what proved to be wrong in order to be surprised, to be a surprise for your opponent in the ring. And in the same way Muhammad Ali was answering to the journalists why he rethought his way of boxing, why he was reinventing his way of boxing, a lot of companies and a lot of employees, a lot of leaders and managers in the awakening of the digitalization nowadays feel the very same way. We are afraid. Why? Because we thought our enemies can read us. Automatization, robots, machines, they can outperform human beings. They can outperform us at chess. They can outperform us at Go. They even outperform us now at poker. Yeah, a Swedish computer liberator was able to beat the best poker players in the world. So we feel that somehow there's an enemy in the ring and we keep on doing what we always did and hope something will change. But the question is not so much about always compare yourself with machines. The question is, where are we different? Where can we make this nice distinction between humans, robots, algorithms, and machines? And if you look around, there's a lot of fear out there. You can see here page one of the Spiegel magazine, German magazine, and they're so equal, right? Whether it was in the 70s or now in 2016, we always have to be afraid. If you look at Hollywood, do you know any positive science fiction movie? No, the world is going down, the planet is destroyed, humans are horrible, everything is going down. There is no such thing as a positive belief of how the future will be like. The same with literature, by the way. We always fear that whatever is happening in the future, whatever will happen in the future, is always horrible. It will affect us, and therefore, let's be afraid. And you can only be afraid if, yes, you have an inability to change, if you take the wrong analysis, and if you make sure that maybe, probably, you don't have to change, but everybody else has, or uh, an organization has. So let's take a look on rethinking digitalization. Let's take a look at those opponents that feel that, okay, my boxing strategy has been analyzed and now maybe I have to be afraid and then let's change. And what are those changes? What needs to be done differently? Number one, digitalization 
is a very, very slow process. As a matter of fact, in history, there's never been such a slow process of a new technology than digitalization. We know ever from the times of the, the, the Turing machines to the 30s, 40s, 50s, then it took a turn in the 80s, then all those beautiful new companies were coming up, and all of a sudden we have nowadays the digitalization. This is 90, 80 years of digitalization. So don't tell me that's fast, it's not coming overnight. We have all the time to prepare. Digitalization is a slow process. But what we fear is, and this is what we can see in some of those uh, studies, is that let's take a look at uh, jobs where it can be re uh, replaced. There's this famous study by Frey and Osborne saying almost 50% of all jobs in the US uh, can be replaced by automatization, uh, are affected directly by algorithms, by machines, or whatever else. But this is a very occupational orientation of a study. Are jobs affected due to automatization? But in reality, it's something else. In reality, it's not about the job that's been replaced. It's about the tasks within a job that's maybe replaced. We still need accountants. We still need bank managers. But what they do certainly changes. If you see the banking crisis of 2008, 2009, and then the digitalization, no other sector has been affected that much than the banking sector from digitalization. Yet, there are more people working in the US in the banking systems than ever before. But what they do certainly has changed. It requires more time for creativity, more time for problem solving, more, more time for intuition, more time for, for innovation, less for routine. Of course, routine jobs, low-skilled, high-skilled, cognitive jobs, all those jobs where you have routine-based tasks to do might and will be replaced by computer. This means that we have two things to keep in mind. First of all, how do we prepare all those people, worker and employees in organizations, to do something else what they do today? And then, even more important, change the education system, which is still based to solve problems from the 20th century, but not necessarily for the 21st century's problem, like problem solving, creativity, intuition, and the ability to get surprised. It needs a whole new approach. And let's take a look at those whole new approach. If you look at discussion today, we all think that digitalization has a lot to do with technology, about STEM and math and algorithms, and that we all, everybody, all the kids need to go in math classes now and be, be perfect then. No. We need to think about where are humans different than computers and machines? What makes this, this difference? And then to come up with this ability to change. And not only to change the, indivi the individual, but also to change the organization, which is basically based on processes, which is based on compliance, which is based on replacing human beings by other human beings. This is not the organization of the 21st century. It needs a lot more networking. People are born to be loved. Technology is made to be used. We should not turn it around. Because nowadays we feel that technology is loved and people are used. And this should not be the way an organization should be designed. So let's reconsider, let's rethink, let's reorganize how we work together now and in the future. And number three, it needs trust. Trust is becoming the most important currency of the future. We have to trust each other. But what we're doing in organizations is that we come up with processes and compliance rules to basically cover 1% of mankind. So that the rest of the 99% are completely unhappy. This needs to change. So we also need a new kind of leadership, where leaders are more developers, where leaders are more setting up an environment when it's possible, you as an individual, to perform accordingly to your task, to your duties, to your responsibilities. Uh, next to your human, to your machines. So the question is not how can we replace humans by machines. It's much more about let's take a look where humans are so much better than machines. 
this emotional strength, this self-impression or self-actualization, this reading between the lines, seeing what body language, making sure that you see a notion. Have you ever noticed how we speak to Siri and to Alexa? Would you ever speak like that to your husband and wife? Siri, tell me the next, the next way to the gas station. Why would I don't talk like this to my wife? And if so, this would not happen for a lot of times. Yeah? <laughs> so the way we speak to computers, the way we speak uh, uh, to, to all those beautiful tools out there is not the way we speak between humans. Our way of communicating, our way of feeling, our way of empathy, our way of tuition, even our human drives of intuition, of getting things done, of moving along, of having new ideas is so important. Startups are like a revolution. Startups and the startup owners are people who say, there is a solution out there, but this solution does not make me happy. This solution basically sucks, and I can make it better. And as an organization, you feel like Muhammad Ali. If you keep on doing what you always did, you will probably never win a fight in the ring. So we need to reconsider and go back to where are humans better than machines? Because it's not humans against machines. It's human and machines. Yes, a computer beat the world champion in chess, the world champion in Go, and the best poker players. But a mediocre player, together with a computer, can beat the chess world champion. A mediocre player of poker with a computer can beat the best player in poker. And a mediocre player of Go can beat the Go champion. So it's all about human and machines, not human or machines. So don't be afraid of using them. Let's come up with solutions how we can make humans ready and prepared to work together. We are not co-drivers. We are not victims. Being a victim is very easy. When you're a victim, you're never responsible. Somebody else is. Uh, bad technology, bad politics, bad organizations, bad leadership, management is bad. Everywhere you look around, you see victims. Being a victim is kind of an easy thing because you're never responsible for anything in your life. You sit back. But the question is not how we will work in the future. The question is how do we want to work? How we work be in the future. And as far as we can see, based on the studies that we know, based on the scientific elementaries that we can see now and that we, that we, can, that we can analyze, it's all about computers, machines, robots, together with human beings to really make ourselves better and to do what we always love to do, being creative, innovative, uh, intuitive. It's all about how we want to work. And then, Let's switch to education. Whenever there is an education system in society, and this education system runs behind technology, a society feels social pain. This is what we felt somewhere in the early stages of the Industrial Revolution, and somehow we feel it again nowadays. But whenever education is ahead of technology, we can see prosperity. This is when you really use technology. And the usage of technology heavily depends on the fact that we are able to come up with an education system that's ready for the 21st century. And if you look around in North America, in most of the parts in Europe, in most of the parts in, in Southeast Asia, there's not one country at this very moment that's not rethinking its education system and it's not rethinking how we can make it better. Adjust the content, adjust the way we learn, adjust the way we teach. Rethink digitalization starts by our ability to adjust education. And what we need is not only a Fridays for Future, we need a greater Thunberg for education. We need a Monday for education. And as we are in Austria here, let me uh, bring up in mind our most famous empress and leader of the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy, Maria Theresia. In 1776, she outlawed torture, and in the same year she came up with a compulsory school system. Maria Theresia didn't do this because she loved all uh, her fellow Austrians. She did this because we were losing the Prussian defeat of Austria. We lost against uh, Prussian soldiers. What did she do? She hired a Prussian monk 
and changed the Austrian school system according to the Prussian school system back at the time. 50 minutes of education, 5 minutes on time. Why? Because 50 minutes was the time a soldier take time to run back and forth and walk back and forth. 240 years later, not a lot has changed. It's still all about this, about this situation that 50 minutes we teach, five minutes of break, and then first, first hour this, second hour this, third hour this. We need to readjust and rethink education. And why did Maria Theresia do this? And this is going up all to the 20th century, up even to this day, 2019, in most of the countries around the globe. Our education system is designed to replace humans by other human beings. This is why you have a certain level on this subject and a certain level on that subject. This is why you have standards here, quality standards there. This is all about making sure that you can be replaced. 21st century education is all about you cannot be replaced anymore because you are an individual. Look at yourself. What subject did you spend most of your time with in school? The subject you were least good at. It's all about where are your strengths, where can you be better off, and come up with an individual plan of education to be non-replaceable. This is what education is all about. This is what we need to think about what's going on. We need to talk about the basics, the competencies, the personal qualities, the getting things done mentality, the ability to be surprised. We have to come up with a whole new approach. And then, of course, it's all about those new beautiful jobs out there. Medical mentors, data scientists, avatar designers, book to app converters, privacy managers. Yes, there are so many great new jobs out there waiting for you to jump in those new jobs because they are ready and they're waiting for you. And it's all about those new uh, 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 responsibilities. Let me come up with the last point. Every single one of you in this room is working hard and tough on solving problems. You are like an acrobat on a rope, in a circle, in a circus. And this is, you try to focus, and you try to focus so hard here that you need balance. But in order to be capable of being successful, an organization needs to give it the ability to balance. It shouldn't be a compliance manager tells you, you don't need to balance like this, you can balance like this. <laughs> and it shouldn't be the controller tells you, you should do this, you should do it like this. The organizations of the future give freedom to the people, give space, give balance. And this is what we need to do. Rethink digitalization. Thank you very much.